Welcome and thank you for joining our discussion. My name is Yuda Handelsman. I'm an endocrinologist actually in solo uh, private practice in Los Angeles. I'm also involved in clinical research and a lot of education. Uh, with me is uh, Dr. Matt Budoff. Matt? Yes, I'm uh, Matt Budoff. I'm a preventive cardiologist and I've been involved in a lot of the diabetes trials over the past uh, uh, five to 10 years now. And uh, uh, also work with uh, Dr. Handelsman on the uh, on some of the uh, educational programs. So uh, I thought we'll discuss today the whole issue of the new medications for diabetes. We call them new; they're not that new. We're talking about the GLP-1 receptor agonist that actually have been on the market for 17 years. The long-acting ones have been on the market for 13 years. We're also discussing the new SGLT2 inhibitors that came to the market in 2013, so it's nine years. So those drugs are not new anymore. Just, you know, we keep saying new. The reason we keep saying new is because of recent outcome trials that show that those drugs that were initially for, for glucose control actually have cardiovascular and kidney benefit. We say new, even that not so new, starting in 2015, if we count, it's already seven years. So nothing is new nowadays when the information uh, of me in medicine doubles up every uh, three months or so. So Matt, when did you become interested in these drugs? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, when the EMPA-REG trial came out, um, I, I think that really changed our, our perception as cardiologists of these agents and that the ability of being able to reduce cardiovascular events and followed by so many trials now that have just shown more and more cardiovascular benefits of both of these classes of agents. So, you know, I actually heard you in a discussion and with other cardiologists, and I keep hearing it all the time, that we, the endocrinologists and diabetologists, we have this glycemic centric view of managing people with diabetes. And that's absolutely not correct. I mean, as you know, I've always looked at the comprehensive approach, the lipid, the blood pressure that prevent cardiovascular disease. So I'm glad that now you cardiologists it finally recognize the fact that people with diabetes have a high cardiovascular risk and we need to manage to prevent cardiovascular uh, disease. So are you able to use these drugs in your practice? Yeah, so we have a wide, wide access to both uh, in, our, in our system here. Um, we can use uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and we can use the GLP-1 receptor agonist for the appropriate patient. So it's kind of interesting. I said, you know, we're not glucocentric. And in fact, I do believe that controlling glucose is very important long term. But in the short term, the data that we got from these drugs are that independent of glycemia, we can actually prevent cardiovascular disease. So how do you use it? How do you choose? Yeah, so, you know, from a cardiovascular standpoint, you know, I, I think that these agents, although they have a lot of overlap and benefit uh, with their uh, weight reduction with their A1C benefits. I think when it comes to cardiovascular, I see the SGLT2s as being a little stronger in the heart failure and the renal uh, side of things, and the uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist being a little stronger in the ASCVD and the coronary artery and, and ischemic stroke realm. So I, I think of vascular disease versus pump disease and kind of choose the right one first, although both is probably better, of course. So, you know, I've been involved in guidelines and have been and just for full disclosure, specifically of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and various recommendations. And the last recommendation we had in 2020, we still say choose either one. We really did not differentiate. And I think recently you and others joined me and we actually created this multi-specialty, the DCRM, diabetes, cardio, renal, metabolic, multi-specialty practice recommendation. When we were trying to approach managing this very complicated patient with diabetes uh, from each direction, from the cardiologist, from the nephrologist, from the primary care physician, from the diabetologist, what did you take out of this approach? 
Well, and, you know, I think that, you know, it's, it was incredible to be working with so many people of different specialties to try to come up with a uniform practice recommendation. And I think, I think, you know, to your credit as our chair, you know, it was a really a big success and I, and I hope it gets widely used. Um, but I, I think it's very helpful. I think you can talk about, you know, what, what disease predominates in that person, if it's obesity, then you might want to go with a, a GLP-1 receptor agonist. They're a little better for weight reduction. If it's A1C control, probably GLP-1 receptor agonist may be the better first line therapy. But I think our guidelines were try to use both of these great agents if, if possible together. And we can't always do that because of cost. But I think largely that's what we should, where we should be going with diabetes control these days. So I think in the recommendation, we did try to differentiate better when to choose one. So kind of um, um, improving and uh, what we've done in the past with other medical societies and try to say when to use which. I think you're right. I think it's clear that if somebody has CKD today, we have to choose an SGLT2 inhibitor because of the great uh, data that we got actually from all the SGLT2 inhibitors in particularly though we have seen it with um, uh, empagliflozin and uh, uh, endapagliflozin which actually we also see that impact in non-diabetes which was important for our recommendation because we looked at patients not just with diabetes but also with cardiorenal metabolic uh, complications uh, and then when we are looking at strokes, clearly a GLP-1, long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, specifically, you know, the semaglutide and the dulaglutide, very specific in preventing strokes. So these two extremes are very clear. Another extreme is a HEFREF, right? A patient has HEFREF with diabetes or without diabetes should use an SGLT2 inhibitors. Is that what you're doing in your practice? And now that you're separating it that way? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I, I think, uh, you know, for, for coronary disease, I still, I believe, and I think the data will bear out the GLP-1 receptor agonist will also be better. Uh, although the biggest benefit was ischemic stroke, but I agree. So I think if they lean in my practice with coronary disease, uh, with diabetes, I, I'm thinking GLP-1, if they're leaning towards heart failure, certainly SGLT2. But I think we have to remember the SGLT2 inhibitors, as you mentioned, extend beyond diabetes now for both the renal benefit and the heart failure benefit. And we don't have that type of data with the GLP-1s. They're still relegated to persons with diabetes. And what's interesting with the SGLT2 inhibitors, and we already incorporated it in our recommendation, the DCRM, is that they have data not only on half ref you know, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but we also have on the PEF with preserved ejection fraction. I hope they're not going to change the name to normal ejection fraction, but that's a different discussion altogether. So now the recommendation for SGLT2 inhibitors for any heart failure. Is that kind of what you see in practice? Yeah, no, absolutely. And now that we have a second trial with uh, with uh, now one with EMPA and one with dapagliflozin, I think it's going to be a class one recommendation for, for any type of heart failure to be on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We already have another drug, but we don't have it yet in the market. Uh, the sotagliflozin, which also showed very strong data on both REF and PEF, it's just supposed to be an SGLT1 and 2 inhibitor. Some people like to tell the one part of that, maybe for cardiovascular disease. It's not on the market, so we, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it does look that the SGLT2 inhibitor will help heart failure, whether it's PEF or F, and PEF seems to track the obesity epidemic. Is that again what you're seeing in practice? No, absolutely. And I, I think that's why I'm, I'm optimistic that we might get some good data out of a GLP-1 receptor agonist, especially for HEF-PEF, where you know, weight reduction is pronounced and, and it looks like it has a nice benefit um, in that regard. But we're obviously waiting for those trials to, to finish before we can start using it in that capacity. So yeah, so in the studies that we have seen, um, 
And that's how our recommendation came. It was for kidney first as you had the two inhibitor, but because we've seen some benefit in the outcome trial of the GLP-1 receptor agonist on the kidney, we said that if we cannot do SGLT2 inhibitor, we will do a GLP-1 receptor agonist. For half ref it's a bit more complicated with it. For half pef there may be emerging data, as you're saying, and there's some trial uh, going on with that. But you know, you mentioned that, that you're looking at the vascular disease, the cardiovascular disease, and that's actually your profession and your forte. There is some data to show that the SGLT2 inhibitors do have some impact on the vascular stuff. Even in MPRAG that we mentioned, where we saw that there was a differentiation within what, two, three months, we already saw the differentiation that was primarily, as you said, has to do with fluid and balance and volume. Uh, but then after one year or so, it was like a new start of a bump. And that looked like it could have been more atherosclerosis type. And with the SGLT2, SGLT1, the sotagliflozin, there's clearly a vascular component that is there. So we allow that if a person cannot have a GLP-1 to do an SGLT2 instead, except for strokes, where SGLT2s clearly do not have benefit on strokes, uh, just like REF, so far we don't see benefit, I think, with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So what about using both? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I, I think that they're, they're so complementary. And again, I mean, most of our patients with diabetes suffer from obesity. They both have help with, with weight reduction through different mechanisms. Um, they both help with A1C control through different mechanisms for the people with diabetes. And, and, and I think there's gonna be a lot of overlap. You know, the GLP-1s have benefit for the kidney also, uh, maybe not as pronounced as, as the SGLT2s, but I think there's gonna be some complementary benefits there as well. So I, I try to get them on both, but of course we have to be careful with prescription therapies and expensive treatments and how many, you know, therapies a patient can afford. I definitely agree. And actually, there is emerging more and more data is emerging that the combination is actually giving more benefit than each one of them. And there is the issue with price. So we kind of move to a whole new paradigm in managing people with diabetes. We have to look at prevent the next event in the short term. I don't know of any drugs that we have to show for stroke and prevention of a stroke in less than two years as we've seen with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So every patient that has a stroke or very high risk to stroke, it's clear it needs to be on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And then many of those patients may have a kidney problem, may have a heart failure, and getting them together would help. For weight loss, the two of them together are very good. And we didn't even go on some off target uh, aspect like liver, for example, that they have some uh, great effect. So, but for price, I agree, for the short term, they will prevent the next event, each one as we describe it. For long term, we still need to control the glucose and the other CV risk factors like lipids and so on. Uh, it's an exciting time, Ahmed. Yeah, no, I'm very, very enthusiastic. And I'm, I'm so glad that we have some of these new therapies that can really benefit our, our high risk patients. Because you remember patients with diabetes, especially those with established ASCVD, if they have cardiovascular disease already, their risk is really high of having an event and dying prematurely. And same can be said of patients with uh, heart failure so, uh, and kidney failure so, or kidney disease. So I think we really have taking the highest risk patients and affording them a great benefit. And I hope that you know many other cardiologists would follow suit because uh, us, we are a very small group. I mean, we cannot care of this patient. Not only that, you've got the patient with a heart failure that needs a specialist, with a kidney problem, need a specialist, with a cardiovascular prevention and management that needs a specialist. And yet many places do not have it. I think we will all need to know how to manage these patients and how to use these drugs. And maybe that's the strength of the DCRM practice recommendation that we did because it allowed the non-experts to follow simple directions and to do what you're now doing, you know, with all the knowledge that you have to manage uh, these patients. 
No, absolutely. And, and I think yeah, I, I strongly encourage people to look at those diabetes, cardiometabolic, uh, 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 renal uh, guidelines. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, um, you know, take, take from that multi-specialty group some great advice on how we can co-manage these patients. So I think with this, uh, Matt, always great uh, sharing uh, some opinions and discussions and actually practice uh, pearls. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful time.